really learn what their business is. And then we advise them what we feel like we can realistically do and give them realistic expectations. Um, you know, sometimes they think it's just going to explode. They're going to sell 200 franchises. You know, when I tell them, um, 90% of the franchisors across the country never hit hundred units, you know, that shocks them. They're like what they think, because all they see is what's on television in main street USA. They don't realize how many franchise concepts are out there. Um, so anyway, um, it's, 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 it's a deep dive into their business, really getting to understand them and their goals and what their, what their aspirations are giving them some realistic uh, I, you know, ways to take a look at it and see what those, what those goals can be reached or not within a reasonable period of time. And then if, if they understand that, then we move forward with them. And then we give them lots of coaching on how to become a successful franchisor, working with their franchisees, communicating with them, using compliance with a carrot, not a stick, all sorts of things. Welcome to the Art of Franchise Marketing. Each episode takes a deep dive into the franchise space and explores how the biggest and best brands handle national branding, franchise development, employee recruitment, and localized marketing on a daily basis. This podcast is brought to you by NetServe, a localized digital marketing partner for franchise networks. NetServe's Madeline Park talks shop with franchise executives to discuss what's working, what's not, and answers the question, what else can you be doing to excel at the art of franchise marketing? Hey everyone, welcome back to the Art of Franchise Marketing. I am your host, Madeline Zook, and today we have Rick Robinson, a franchising veteran, um, and he's going to help us dive into what it really takes to build, to sell, to market, to operate, you know, successful franchise operations. So Rick, thanks for coming on today. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. So we'll just dive right in, Rick. Tell me how you got into franchising, what your history is like there. I know it's extensive, so, you know, hopefully we can, you know, consolidate it. And then also what you're yeah. doing at Franchise Genesis now. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, so I, uh, my first career, I was in television advertising sales and we met the founder of a company called Jana King, which was the first master franchise model in commercial cleaning. And he had sold five master territories, mostly to college buddies of his. Uh, a couple were doing a pretty good job, but the others weren't. And he knew we had a good idea. So he said, well, I want to open some corporate owned and run offices to really figure the model out. So in 1984, I joined two other executives and we opened three corporate locations, tweaked the model and it exploded. And they became the biggest commercial cleaning franchise in the world. So of course, as this was taking off, the three of us wanted to have some ownership. So myself and one of the other executives purchased the rights to Jana King of Phoenix then we did Tucson, then we did New Mexico. And we eventually had three master franchised offices, 230 cleaning franchisees, and we were cleaning about a thousand buildings a month. So wow. did that for about 25 years. Also during that time, I became very active with the International Franchise Association, eventually was elected to their board of directors and served on the board for four years. Then I started my own consulting business. The economy crashed in 08, 9, and 10. I was hired a couple of different times by franchisors struggling. I came on board to help do turnarounds for them. Um, so I've done a little bit of everything. Um, you asked me about, so I had 39 years of franchising experience. I, I laughingly tell people, I go back to right before the internet was invented and no one was using it yet. So things have changed a lot. <laughs> in that amount of time. I imagine. And then tell me about Franchise Genesis, because that's how you and I kind of got off on this this conversation. And, and, you know, when we were talking initially, you know, I was just amazed at the the amount and the extent to which you have really added to the franchise community. So talk to me a little bit about that. Yes. So Franchise Genesis, we started it up about two and a half years ago, and we are a franchise creation company. So we take independent businesses and we turn them into a franchise or, but we are a complete package. We're full service. So we have excellent franchise attorneys to create their legal documents, the FDD and agreement. 
My team then writes their operations manual for them, which will be the SOP for how the franchisees run the business and giving them total control over the quality. Uh, our marketing company goes to their website, adds the link saying that they have franchises available, creates the four to five landing pages that describe the franchise opportunity. They create a nice franchise brochure that they can email to people. We create a nice uh, two minute drill that can be used by all the consultants, coaches, and brokers out there. Um, but then we include some other marketing uh, with, from some of our sister companies. Uh, the Great American Franchise Expo is a sister company. So we exhibit them in 12 franchise expos, gathering leads for them. That's all included, giving those leads back to them. Uh, we also own a magazine called the Franchise Journal that is emailed out to half a million people every month. So we do a full page profile about their new franchise offering and then 12 more full page ads. So that entire package is what we include. So it's not just turning them into a franchisor. We also give a training, um, franchise marketing and sales training and operations training, uh, talking about compliance and good communications with franchisees. So teaching them to be a full, well-rounded franchisor. And, you know, I think the most important you you key aspect i guess i should say of this is that you don't just like you said you don't just write their fdd and release them into the wild because we know that everyone thinks that their concept is the best and it's going to do well franchising but it's, it's a much bigger beast than people anticipate so having that you know that operational support the guidance the coaching as well as ongoing services too. You guys also can provide franchise sales as well if they need help with that, correct? That is correct. So after we have franchised them and given them all the marketing that's included in their package, we offer ongoing franchise marketing and sales services, taking their leads, you know, uh, eliminating all the tire kickers, qualifying everyone, and we'll take them all the way through an FDD review. And if the, the uh, candidate is still really interested, then we hand them over to the franchisor. So it's a very good qualified lead. So yeah, so we're kind of a mini FSO in that regard to help them get started. But we tell them, we want to teach you to take this on yourself when you're ready. We also uh, introduce them to the, the consultant matchmaker broker networks when they're ready. So one at a time, um, but we've had some big success stories there. So when they're ready to take on a lot of territory checks, and, and really try to expand their brand, we help them do that as well. And, you know, I want to draw attention to this because i am come from the kind of build it over buy it system. You know, we <laughs> built our own origin brand when I was at Threshold. And the services you're offering, I could see someone who's a veteran in the space being like, oh yeah, you know, they can charge a lot of money and then do all of this for them. And then they never learn how to do it themselves, but that's simply not the case here. And I wish that we had found you guys when we were doing it, you know, a decade back, obviously you weren't in, in business then, but I wish we had you then because I like to say like franchising is, is such a long game in all aspects. And the fact that you can help take them, you know, franchise their business on all the operational and logistics fronts, teach the founders, teach the management team, but then on, you know, on the flip side, franchise sales is a beast and you really need to know the brand inside and out in order to sell it and to make a good, you know, candidate matching system, if you will. Um, and who better to do that than the person who helped create the system. So, you know, that is a, gr a great benefit for these founders to have, because a lot of times, as you know, they try to take it on themselves because they're the only ones that truly, you know, understand the brand or, you know, want to expand their family um, per se. And then on top of that, what you mentioned about introducing them to the broker networks, I talked to a lot of emerging brands about, do I go to this retreat? Who do I join? Who do, you know, why I join and I'm not getting leads. I'm like, broker networks are a monster of a lead generation because there are so many brokers out there um, and you have to find the right ones. You have to find the ones that are going to, you know, sell or great at selling in your ear industry, your concept, and then, you know, making those relationships for your brand. And, and quite frankly, it took myself and Threshold probably close to two years to really start even ramping up the territory checks with just a handful of brokers. So the fact that you have already pre-established those relationships um, and you're able to say, okay, 
here's the credibility of franchise Genesis or, you know, from Rick himself saying, mm -hmm. this is a legit brand. We've trained them. They've got the stamp of approval on here. They're going to take care of your candidates go. That is an, you know, something that can save thousands of dollars and, and on travel on, you know, just time itself. Um, so, you know, I think that that is something definitely important that you don't want to, you know, necessarily gloss over, you know, for the people that are, are thinking about, uh, you know, doing this in general. So how many brands have you taken to, I want to say taken to market, but taking to franchising through Franchise Genesis so far? Yeah, we did 55 last year and Thank about you. one third are food, every kind of concept you can think of from simple juice models up to a brewery. Uh, but the other two thirds are everything you can imagine from the typical, you know, boutique fitness, every kind of home service, but there's lots of unique things that are coming out now. So we, we're well experienced in all aspects of all types of industries. And so are the franchise attorneys that we use. Sure. Sure. And I want to, you know, ask you a little bit about that. You said, you know, the franchise attorneys you use, I think that this is a segment along with finance that's often uh, kind of ignored. Maybe it's like the boring part of hiring. People always talk about their C-suites and their marketing and their salespeople. How important is it to have attorneys and, you know, a legal department that understands franchising specifically? It's very important. First off, every franchise concept is unique and different. They may come from the same industry area. But, you know, many times, especially if it's a medical model of some type or senior care model, um, you know, there are there are all sorts of state uh, laws and issues that have to be adhered to. It's, you know, once you have your FDD, does it mean you can go across the country selling franchises at will? Um, every state is unique. And, so, you know, some of them require that doctors are an actual partner in certain types of models. So it's really important for the attorneys to know and understand these laws and the differences from the filing states and the registration states to be able to coach and help the franchisor decide if and when they're ready to go into certain types of states. And if they are, they have to make sure that they're preparing the franchisees for whatever the laws uh, and issues are for that particular state. Yeah, and, and that's a great overview and, uh, you know, <clears throat> the magnitude at which I want people to understand is, you know, if you mess up in a state, they can bar you from ever franchising there. You know, this is right. very intricate, very, uh, you know, heavy handed uh, material that you, you know, you definitely need a professional to look at, look at. I know some people say, Oh, I'm not going to hire a lawyer. Or I'll read the FDD myself. Sure. You know, maybe that can get you into trouble in the future, but if you're, you know, trying to do that on the franchise or level, you know, there's way too much there and, and way too much at risk to try to do that yourself or, you know, via a legal zoom or something like that. Well, and, and they all think that all franchise attorneys are the same. It's just all cut and paste jobs. I said, no, it's not. Of mm -hmm. course, there's certain templates for certain areas and industries, but they're going to look at you as a unique model. They're going to go out and see, are there any other competitors franchising similar to you? Gather their legal documents, take a look at those and make some comparisons. So they, they're going to build the best legal docu documents for you and your model. Uh, it's not all cut and paste templates. It's funny. I was just, I don't know if you watched it, but Netflix just came out with a series called Painkillers about, you know, the Oxycontin and all of that. I, and I, I, I just watched that the other night. Yeah, yes. and you know, it, it reminded me of, you know, when they were trying to get that FDA approval and they just kept copy and pasting, you know, thinking it'd get through and, you know, yeah. uh, you know, I mean, obviously it didn't really work out in our favor, but you know, in the beginning he just said, no, like this is, you're not like every <laughs> other drug out there. We got to, you That's know, right. into this. That's right. Yeah. So talk to me, you know, expanding a little bit more on that, what makes a concept good for franchising? You know, we have a lot of emerging brands on here or a lot of brands that, that want to franchise or maybe they just started. In your opinion, you know, what are some of the key aspects that make a concept, whatever industry, you know, ready to roll? Yeah, well, there's several things, you know, people will ask me, so how do you know if my my concept is franchisable, Rick? I said, well, well first, I'm going to ask you three simple questions. One is your current model profitable. Can you teach someone else how to do it? And three, are there plenty of customers across the country that your franchisees could sell these products and services to? If it's yes to those three, you're probably franchisable. Now let's take a deeper dive. 
Then we get into making sure that that that, that the CEO or founders understand that their whole mentality is going to need to shift now because they're, they're focused on running their current day-to-day -day operation, whether it's one location or five, but now they need to focus on finding, awarding, training, and supporting franchisees because that's going to be their sole source of income. The royalties coming back from these franchisees. And if the franchisees feel like they're not being supported and given the attention that they deserve, all of a sudden that royalty becomes like a tax to them, right? You have to make sure you're showing value uh, and the services you need to show for the royalties that the franchisees are paid. But also I tell people, you know, success is relative. You know, I'll have people come to me and, you know, they're not sure if they want a franchise. And after I ask them, you know, once I learn what are their current annual revenues per location, uh, what's their idea of success? And many of them, they say, boy, if I just had, once they learn what the royalty could be, they're like, wow, if I just had 10 or 12 franchisees in Florida, Georgia, and the Carolinas, I'd be happy. Well, that's fine. You can do that. Once they realize that maybe each franchisee is paying them $50,000 a year, and then after I educate them that the big difference now is you're coaching and mentoring business owners. You're not getting bogged down in the day-to-day -day operations and issues with employees. So typically, on average, it's about one corporate support person for every 10 to 15 franchisees, depending on the kind of services you're providing for the franchisees. And they're shocked at that, you know, they're because they're used to running their own operation and, you know, dealing with employee headaches every single day with turnover and what have you, right? And so that shocks them. But of course, then we get the others that say, oh, Rick, I want to sell 200 or 300 franchises and exit the company in a few years. Well, we might be able to help you do that as well, right? So sometimes they have expectations that are unrealistic and others don't realize it's not going to be as difficult, you know, as they think it is. Now, getting back to your question, though, um, you know, every once in a while we'll turn down a model because they don't have a large customer base across the country or the type of person they would sell a franchise to is so finite and narrow that maybe it doesn't make sense. Right. Um, so, you know, we do a deep dive. We really learn what their business is and then we advise them what we feel like we can realistically do and give them realistic expectations. Um, you know, sometimes they think it's just going to explode. They're going to sell 200 franchises. You know, when I tell them 90% um, of the franchisors across the country never hit 100 units, you know, that shocks them. They're like, what? They think because all they see is what's on television in Main Street, USA. They don't realize how many franchise concepts are out there. Um, so anyway, um, it's, 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 it's a deep dive into their business, really getting to understand them and their goals and what their, what their aspirations are, giving them some realistic, uh, I, you know, ways to take a look at it and see what those, what those goals can be reached or not within a reasonable period of time. And then if, if they understand that, then we move forward with them and then we give them lots of coaching on how to become a successful franchisor working with their franchisees, communicating with them, using compliance with a carrot, not a stick, all sorts of different things. I love this. I have no notes. Like that was just a master class and, <laughs> and, and, you know, franchising a concept, but you know, my, my, I have a question too. And obviously these people who come on and they say they want to franchise their business probably have a handful, one, if not a handful of their own corporate locations. What do you suggest they do with those? Do you farm those out to another owner? Do you have them still manage that? Because I think that there's a lot of push and pull, even in some you know large franchise franchise companies I work with about what do we do with the corporate store? Yeah, so I, I, I usually recommend to them keep at least one for now, but when someone comes along that's interested in buying, buying an existing location and they will, to sell that off just so they, they can keep their focus on the franchisees and the franchise business and not running the day-to-day -day operation. You know, it's good to have at least one location just for trying new things, whether it be marketing, if your food is trying new menu items, um, and, and it's for training your franchisees. You need to have a location to train with. Excuse me. Um, now, many times they're reluctant because they think, oh, that's my only source of income. And we tell them, well, you're going to sell it for more than the franchise fee because it's an existing business and you're going to continue to receive royalties off of that existing location. So, 
they're usually a little reluctant in the beginning, but then after they see, you know, the advantages of it, most of them are willing to sell them off uh, as a franchise location and keep one or two for themselves. Yeah. And what is, you know, if people are saying, okay, you know, I am, I'm going to do this, I'm going to invest money. I'm going to, you know, potentially eventually sell this off. What is an, uh, an average time do you think that, you know, founders can start seeing credible royalties come through? Cause initially, you know, people are starting off with no clients and, and that yeah. sort of thing. So when do you actually see a franchisor starting to make money? Yeah. I mean, we have those unicorns out there, but I tell all of them, I said, first year, you know, don't expect to sell more than a couple of franchises. All right. Mm -hmm. And we hope that they already have someone in mind, you know, friend, family, customer. Um, and they have to cut them a deal to get them on board because the faster they have a trailblazer and someone to validate the model, the training and support, the faster they can take off. So, mm -hmm. um, but I, we're, we tell them, don't expect much that first year. It's going to be a lot of work. You know, once I explain to them that how many leads it takes to actually uh, convert one into a sale, they're kind of shocked at that, right? right? Even once they start getting most of their leads from the broker networks, I tell them, listen, you're only going to sell seven to ten percent of these pre-qualified leads, and they're like, well, why? They're already pre-qualified because they're also showing them four, five, six other great models for them that they think are a good fit. So they're these are people who are going to buy a business. They have money and they're looking at a variety of options, right? Mm -hmm. So it, there's a lot of training to make sure they have realistic expectations and understanding this, the sales awarding process and how many people you're going to go through. You know, especially today, it's so easy for people just to jump on the Internet and look around and ask for information. Fifty percent of those you never even have contact with. They won't respond to emails, right. text messages. And so that shocks them in the beginning they, they they don't understand that because they you know they they have a lot of personal investment in their business right, right. um so it this comes part of our training making sure they have realistic expectations but then we explain to them you know once you do have some happy franchisees that will validate the model first you're going to start getting some referrals from them but now all of a sudden the the broker networks will be much more uh willing to send you leads because many of them are going to sit back and wait a while. You know, I explained to them, I said, all they do is, is work hard to find someone that's really interested in buying a franchise. Once they right. found that person, they are going to match them up with several great options that are a good fit for them to help them buy a business. Well, I promise you, they're only going to show them brands that have happy franchisees that their people can talk with. Uh, unless they know you, they have a personal relationship with you. Or you are the kind of brand everybody's waiting for because all the others are sold out in your industry and they really need another one, right? So, sure. you know, it, it, it's part of that education process, making sure they understand how franchising really works and the effort it's going to take. But then it does start to ramp up and they'll start to see a lot more qualified leads coming from all sources. And, um, you know, and then things will really take off once they have multiple franchisees to validate the training and the support of the model. And talk to me about, you know, I love the emphasis on, you know, realistic goals. This is really what's going to happen because I think a lot of times uh, brands will sit back or, you know, owners will sit back and say, oh, all of these brands are selling 16 territories, 16 locations. You know, there was a brand that uh, I was unfortunate. Well, I don't say unfortunate, but I was working with and they had signed 200 locations in the first four months, you know, obviously they were in development and I was like, this is a train headed for a brick wall, but yeah. you know, everyone loves to splash around the locations. And you know, that's something that I, I want to talk to you about because we see a lot of rapid growth with people using like singular FSOs, like that's their only job is to sell locations or, you know, they go to a broker network and they see a brand that sells 50 locations in a quarter. And they're like, why not me? So talk to me about the, the, pros and cons around that and what's really going on behind the scenes because I tell a lot of people everyone judge a territory and a location differently I could own 10 made pros or if you cut up the territory in a different FDD I own 50 so it's like <laughs> it's not it's not you know it's all yeah. subjective so talk to me about your thoughts there yeah well I'm glad you brought up territory because 
you know, that's one of the other issues with franchisors. I tell all of them, usually one of the biggest mistakes franchisors make is giving away too large of a territory. And that's because they never had to be restricted by a territory before. They're used to just going anywhere across the metropolitan area or the state, right? And, mm-hmm. and so we help coach them and teach them that, you know, it's easy to give away some more territory down the road, but you want to make, you, you want to maximize the, the effort by a franchisee in penetrating and developing their territory, which will maximize the, the royalties coming back to you. Because uh, mm-hmm. I've been there many, many times. I, the, the two turnarounds I helped with, they gave away giant territories. And it was partly because they didn't realize the other customer verticals they were going to uncover. So I talked to these people. I said, where, where is your industry going? Let's think of the other areas that, you know, that might really expand your customer base within a given population. And so we help them understand that as well, because they've never been restricted by territory before. And mm-hmm. so we, we coach them on that and, and we tell them the attorneys are going to be good at that. We're going to look at other competitors that have been around a while that have retweaked their territory model over a number of years because they've made the mistakes that we're warning you about. Mm-hmm. Um, so also I, I coach them about, you know, when we talk about selling franchises, I say, okay, at the end of year one or two, uh, franchisors can fall into two categories that have not sold. That first, that they're not selling hardly any franchises because they're looking for themselves, that perfect business owner that's just like them. And I say, you're not going to find that person. You have to be open to good, solid business people that will listen to you, follow a system and run the business the way you want them to. And I said, and then unfortunately they start to get desperate and they start to sell franchises to people that they shouldn't because they think they need those franchise fees to come in just to have, help cover payroll and such. So we, we coach them on both of those aspects of it. Um, I don't know if that answers your question or not, but. No, it does. Yeah. yeah. And I think it's important to note that what you said, like they're looking for people that's like them. They, and then they sell to anyone. And I tell a lot of people, because Frandev is, you know, always a hot topic, but even more now, um, is that as much as you make personas for your consumer marketing, you have to do that for your franchise uh, candidates. Because, you know, there are people that have, like you said, success is relative. Some people that want to be that entrepreneur and build the empire. You've got the people that just want to make it to their kids' soccer games. Um, and that's not always going to line up. You know, it's funny because the my way of thinking is like straight line as efficient as possible get me there as quick as possible my mom's is like a little circle cyclone maze and eventually she gets there but we know we bump heads because i'm like that is so inefficient like what are you doing but then again you know everyone loves her she's very successful and gets there and it took me a while right until i was like 28 to realize like oh it's not wrong it's just different (laughs) like okay well and that's and that gets back to the this is part of the training, but we will get businesses coming to us that want to franchise that are really ready. They have Mm -hmm. all their systems down in writing, in manuals, in training. Many have videos, which is unbelievable. But then we get the others. It's all in their head, right? It's like nothing's on paper anywhere, even though they might be running an efficient business that it's, it's not written down anywhere. So we work with them to help them do that writing their operations manual, putting the systems in place that they just have in their head that is not, you know, in writing anywhere. So, you know, in, there's, there's so many things that have changed that make things easier today, right? I mean, just the, the virtual training you can do with franchisees now on Zoom calls. Um, there's, there's it's, yeah, what COVID did was really open our eyes to other ways of doing things and it forced us to do it. Like restaurants, oh my God. I don't know if I'm working with any restaurants that have not shrunk their square footage. And most of them now have some kind of a food truck. I'm I'm franchising two different food trucks right now. And they actually have gotten rid of the brick and mortar model. They've kept it for their corporate location. No, I'm only selling food truck franchises now. So it's caused us to rethink everything. The ghost kitchen concept. I mean, you know, who would have thought, right? Um, They became huge. So it's, it's, even though it, it caused us all a lot of pain and suffering for a few years. It also allowed us to rethink. I mean, I was an old school guy. I'm an old guy, right? Uh, <laughs> for, for me to have employees scattered across the country and not come in and see them in the office every single day, that was hard for me to get my arms around. 
now I do. I have, you know, I, I have, don't have any employees in Florida where I live. Our headquarters is in Charlotte. I have two employees there. I have an employee in Scottsdale. And, you know, so they're scattered around. Of course, they tend to be more executive models for the most uh, people sure. for the most part, which makes it easier. But yeah, it's, uh, it's caused us, it's caused a lot of changes. Yeah. Sure. And, you know, we're coming up on time, but I have a couple, you know, final questions. One being for the brands that have already decided to franchise, they're already there, they're in the weeds. They maybe they've got one or two locations. What is your advice to them when, you know, they hear 90% of franchises don't make it over a hundred, you know, units. What is your advice to them? If that is their goal to get there? Yeah. Well, first I want to find out why is that your goal? What are the reasons? Because you just want to sound big and be big and then sell it, right? So it, it, usually I try to get back to, okay, what are your financial goals? And then why why are these goals the way they are? Sometimes I help them readjust them. But the other way is then really identifying instead of, too often they have a scattered approach for marketing and they've got you know junk leads coming in from everywhere just because they want lots of leads. So many times it's refining how they're identifying and attracting good candidates. You know, LinkedIn and, and, and social media now allows us to target certain types of people with certain backgrounds and job titles much better than it used to be. You may be paying more per lead, but let's look at qualified leads. That's what really matters because right. non-qualified leads take up a lot of your time. I mean, it's, it's just takes forever just sending out emails and leaving phone calls and text messages takes time for someone to do that. So uh, it's, it's many times it's refining the marketing that they're doing. Um, and even if they're going to use broker networks, it, you know, it, it's the 80, 20 rule, 80% of them kind of do it part time and don't do that many deals to begin with. So you're really focusing on that 20% of the brokers out there that really do a lot of deals. And the ones who do a lot of deals have an, a huge network out there. So if you do have a specific type of candidate that you want to target, there's usually a percentage of them can really do that for you because of the marketing they've been doing for years and the database they have, and maybe people they've already sold franchises, helped buy franchises, uh, looking to add something else to you know their portfolio. So it's it's target being more targeted in the marketing side of things, I think, and and helping them get over that big commission that's going to go to a a consultant or a broker. I mean, listen, right. it's it's a success fee. You're, it's always your decision whether to award a franchise to someone or not. And if you're doing a good job on your own SEO marketing and organic marketing, then you'll have you'll sell some of those and you'll get to keep the entire franchise fee. Yeah, and people are always shocked when they come to me and they say, "I want to sell sixty units next year, and my budget, I'm going to spend you know a thousand a month." And I'm like, "The <laughs> hell you are!" I was like. What's your current cost per acquisition? You're using broker network. So off the off right. the cuff, it's probably, you know, twenty five to thirty five thousand. They're like, yeah, but I'm like, okay, so if that's just a baseline cost per acquisition <laughs> and you're gonna spend twelve thousand dollars and gonna get sixty units, the math ain't mathin'. Like that's it's right. you gotta you gotta, you know, get a that's get right, a yeah. good good handle on it because it is such a different kind of spend volume beast than consumer is. Um well, and Rick, my last get into the I'm sorry. Then we get into, you know, the registration states. Right. How many of those do you want to go into? So not only right. the initial registration of a couple of grand, then you have, you know, the renewal fees every spring with your new FDD for each registration state. So I, we really try to do a good job of outlining all their upcoming fees that they're not thinking about. You know, the fee we charge, which is, is currently on $59,500, that entire package, right? Um, but we lay out, okay, here are the other upcoming fees you're going to have over the next six months. And then what it's going to be like next year when you have renewals that turn, that come around. Right. Yeah. And it's so important to note because you always say like, you, you know, you get into, I'm going to redo my kitchen. It's going to be a hundred thousand dollars. No, no, it's not. It's always the hidden fees. There's always yeah. the added things. You need this, you need that. So it's really good to have, you know, a playbook out there, especially when, you know, in the beginning, when you're you're waiting for those royalties, you're waiting for kind of that money to come yeah. in. What, one so other Rick, thing that's... A, yeah. No, I sorry, one other it. thing that's really important that kind of helps get them across the line often is I ask them, I say, so if you sold your independent business right now, what do you think you could get for it? 
sometimes they have no clue. Sometimes they do. And I say, yeah, it's, it's going to be three times your EBITDA, four times is a home run, right? Let me tell you what it's like in the franchise world. You're going to be purchased by a private equity company. You're going to be getting a minimum of 10 to 15 times your EBITDA. And sometimes it can go as high as 25. A lot of that's based on, you know, how many units you have, what are the recurring royalties coming in currently when they when they start to make offers, what's the potential for future growth, both domestically, internationally. Uh, and they're like shocked by the head. They have no idea. I say, so <laughs> would you rather spend some money right now to build this franchise system, but sell it for 15 times what you're going to sell it for if you just, you know, try to build it yourself right now and open a couple more corporate locations and be pulling your hair out because of the employee issues you're dealing with. Right. Yeah. And, you know, I came from uh, an umbrella brand that got bought out and those private equity companies, they don't play around, man. They have, you know, their financials on lock. They're ready to go. They love to see something that's going to, you know, grow. So spot on there. Um, and before we get cut off, my, my final questions are, if you had a piece of advice to give to a franchisee of any size, what would it be? And if you had a piece of advice to give to a franchisor of any size, what would that mm -hmm. be? Okay. So if, if it's someone thinking of buying a franchise, uh, I want to tell them, are you a team player? Can you follow systems? Are you okay with authority? Are you okay with having a partner in your business? Um, and, but you know, do you want to be part of something big, something that's going to become national? If not, if you're a maverick and you don't like to take, you know, follow rules, then I say, don't buy. So if they're already a franchisee, and let's say they're having some issues, I, you know, because I've coached, you know, I've, I've sold hundreds and hundreds of franchises in my life. It's finding out where are the issues and learning how to, I mean, it's a marriage. It's at least 10 years unless you sell it before then. So, you know, and it's how I coach the franchisors. Hey, make sure you feel good about bringing this person on as a franchisee. They're going to be your business partner for at least 10 years, right? Uh, you can't just fire them like an employee. So, so, so as a franchisee, it's, if, if they're struggling a little bit, trying to find out why are you struggling? Are you not following the system? Are you not willing to listen? Uh, also, there's always mentors within a franchise system, other successful franchisees that get it. They may not be perfectly happy with everything, the way the, the, the franchisor is running things, but it's all about being part of a successful system where you can build, make the kind of money you want to make, and maybe exit and sell it someday. Franchisor, first, becoming a franchisor, really make sure they understand what their responsibilities legally are going to be when you start selling franchises and training and supporting these franchisees. If you're not willing to do that, then just open one or two more corporate locations and just do that, right? After you're a franchisor, and if they're struggling a little bit with franchisees won't get in line and do what they want them to do, uh, I've coached many of them to, you need to help them exit with honor. A bad apple or a troublemaker is not going to change. You need to help them get out of the system, help find them a buyer. They walk away happy with money in their pocket and you've sold that territory to someone else. It's fresh blood running that unit. So yeah, you don't wait till you're really at odds. Unfortunately, yeah. from my early career in the eighties, I was a part of a huge lawsuit. We won, but that was one of the most expensive educations I've ever had that I wish I'd never gotten. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's hit it head on. Don't shy away from it. It won't get any better. And if they can't get in line because it's just not a good fit, then help them exit with honor. I love that advice because so often, uh, you know, franchisors, uh, and forget that it's not always, you know, it, it's okay if it doesn't work, you know, yeah. there are ways out of it. And also a lot yeah. of people, their goal is not to own their franchise for decades and decades. Their goal is to right. eventually get out. So whether that's sooner or later, um, to have a plan in place and to be ready to coach and help through that is is super important. Well, Rick, thanks for coming on. You guys can um, check out Rick and connect with him on LinkedIn. Same thing with Franchise Genesis. Find them online, connect with them. Um, and we look forward to seeing the other 55 plus brands I'm sure you're bringing on <laughs> this year, Rick. <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Thanks for listening to The Art of Franchise Marketing. This show is brought to you by NetSertive. We help franchise brands and multi-location businesses run localized digital marketing at scale. 
To learn more, visit netsertive.com.